Got it. Yes. Jump right in here. Awesome. Um, thank you guys um, for coming out tonight. Uh, like Caitlin said, my name is Matt. Um, we're going to be talking tonight about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Um, we're going to go through a lot of grounds. Uh, I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I possibly can. Um, but the main goal here tonight is for you guys as, as landowners living on Seneca Lake to have a better understanding of you know, what HWA is, what's happening to your trees, and sort of options you might have to take to help so without further ado, um, a little bit about myself, um, and, and Caitlin already did a great job explaining it, um, but I am the Terrestrial Invasive Species Coordinator for the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we are a partnership between the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart William Smith um, and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation with the goal of advancing invasive species education, outreach, and management in the Finger Lakes region. So we cover um, 17 counties, as you can see here, um, uh, including, you know, sort of Geneva, sort of like right in the center of that. We cover um, Rochester area, where um, I'm actually presenting this from, uh, Syracuse area, Binghamton, Ithaca, Southern Tier, all the Finger Lakes are in there. Um, huge area is what we cover and do the, that sort of work in. Now, we are not the only organization that exists in this capacity. We are one of eight regional prisms in New York State. So every region of New York State has a sort of sister branch of us that is doing largely the same sort of work, just in different parts of the state. So if you go out towards Buffalo, there's a Western New York prism, the Adirondacks, there's the Adirondack prism, Long Island is a Long Island prism, there's so on and so forth. Now, when we're talking about hemophilia delgid, you know, we're talking about invasive species. I feel like it's important for us to understand and sort of be on the same page. It, what we're, what do we mean by what we're talking about in invasive species? And I think these three pictures do a really good job of showing us um, sort of the scale of damage that invasive species are capable of causing. So these are three different invasive species. Um, up here we have uh, spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth. They defoliated all the all these trees in Pennsylvania. You know, we see all these brown patches that stretch way, way off to the horizon. Um, all these trees were defoliated by spongy moth, one of our worst um, terrestrial invasive species. Down here, um, all this crud covering this car, we're all familiar with this guy. These are zebra mussels. Uh, zebra mussels are one of our worst aquatic invasive species. There are quite, quite, excuse me, quite literally trillions of them in um, North America now, and there's so many sucking so many nutrients out of the water column. It's completely changed the way that our aquatic food webs uh, function. And finally, over here on the right, uh, this is an invasive species that we don't have here in upstate New York, although climate change might have something to say about that. Any of you have ever gone um, driving on a highway down south in the Carolinas or Virginia or something like that, um, this is kudzu. Um, and you can see here, kudzu is pretty much just swallowed this forest. It's pretty much eaten all of these trees. All this ground cover is just covered in kudzu. You can imagine if you were, are a plant living in this environment or you were an animal living here as well, um, you're not having a great time, right? So when we're talking about HWA and we're talking about invasive species in general, what is it about these particular organisms that are very consistently related to one another, right? We're talking about a vine, we're talking about a moth, we're talking about some mussels. These organisms aren't really similar on the surface at all, but what, what makes them so successful as compared to other species um, out there? So when we're thinking of invasive species, invasive species is really anything, any organism that is non-native to an ecosystem and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So it could be one of these things, it could be all three of these things, it could be a combination of these things. Either way, an invasive species is something that's non-native, it's not it did not originally evolve in this place, and whose introduction then is causing some kind of harm. And generally, when we're thinking of invasive species, when we're thinking of all these different invasive species and the characteristics that they share, um, they're shared sort of these sort of characteristics. So for one, invasive species have a really high reproductive rate. So we're, you know, if you've ever watched like a David Attenborough nature documentary, and he's talking about some cactus that blooms, you know, with the stroke of midnight once every 10 years, and it's only pollinated by female, you know, ruby-throated hum hummingbirds, <laughs> you know, that, those are not the species we're talking about <laughs> when we're talking about invasive species. These are species that have really high reproductive rates. They're able to pump out seeds, pump out eggs really, really quickly. They're really aggressive, so they don't waste any time um, expanding their populations either. Um, 
they often have no natural predators in their new um, ecosystems. So we often think of them as sort of the potato chips of the natural world, because it turns out that many invasive species have really low nutritional value. Um, and finally, I don't think this last point gets mentioned often enough, but invasive species are just really good at taking advantage of human disturbance. So what I mean by that is, um, as we humans continue to change the landscape of our planet, it turns out that invasive species tend to do really well in these new environments that we are creating. Now, how does this even happen? Well, there's a lot of different ways invasive species get moved around intentionally and by accident. International trade, the pet trade, landscaping, hitchhiking on vehicles, but so generally, for our intents and purposes, in the eastern United States, most of our invasive species are coming from two parts of the world. That's a lot, largely either Europe or Eastern Asia. And there's two reasons for that. For one, um, these are the two parts of the world that are the most similar climactically to our own. So these are the two parts of the world, you know, they have hot summers, they have cold winters, they could survive our temperature extremes pretty well. And these are also the two parts of the world that we in the United States are just the most tied into, right? So this is where the most tourism is going back and forth, the most international trades going back and forth. As we are crisscrossing the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, well, it turns out we're not the only species going along for that ride. Now, once invasive species get here, um, the costs are very widespread. Make sure you write all this down. This is all going to be on the test later. Um, economically, we're thinking of impacts on agriculture, on forestry, on tourism. Environmentally, we're thinking about impacts on biodiversity, number of different species that we have living in an area. Uh, we're thinking about impacts on natural processes and aesthetics, and even on human health. You know, we can see decreases in water quality, increases in flooding, and in some cases, even disease and illnesses. And these aren't abstract concepts. You know, so these we can put sort of real data behind these numbers. Um, so ecologically speaking, invasive species have directly contributed to hundreds of species extinctions worldwide, like our friend the golden toad down here who is no longer with us. Um, and even if they're not causing extinctions, they're causing the decline of thousands and thousands of more species. And economically speaking, in the United States alone, we collectively spend $120 billion every single year controlling invasive species. So. Um, you know, this is not <laughs> a cheap problem. <laughs> um, this is something that, um, you know, we are having to pay out of our own pockets, maybe to, you know, remove some invasive species from our property. It's money that's going into our tax dollars to remove invasive species from a national park. Um, the costs are really, really widespread when we're thinking about invasive species. And again, I just like to reiterate here, this is $120 billion, not over the course of a decade, not over the course of five years. This is every single year we're spending $120 billion in just the United States. When we even extrapolate that, a global perspective, the cost has got to be you know, astronomic at that point. A big problem with invasive species is that despite all the damage that they're able to cause, invasive species tend to be able to um, spread a lot faster than we are able to keep up with. Um, and HWA is certainly um, one of those species. So let's talk about what we're actually here to learn more about tonight. Hemlock woolly adelgid, HWA, what is it? Why do we care? And why am I being paid to tell you about HWA right now? Well, when we're thinking about HWA, this is often the image that comes to mind. It's, it's your typical hemlock twig. And you look on the other side of these needles and you see these white falls underneath. This is the classic telltale sign of HWA and the consequences of when you start seeing these white puffballs on your hemlock trees can be quite tired because unfortunately it can lead to situations like this. Um, this is a picture taken uh, from North Carolina in the Appalachian Mountains where hemlocks are typically pretty abundant down there. And this is what happens when HWA rolls through a, a really big hemlock forest. You can see it's pretty much wiped out um, everything um, living in this picture, besides for a few of the hardwoods that are sort of mixed in, but all of these hemlocks were wiped out. And when we're thinking about invasive species in general, when we're thinking about, you know, um, the, the costs of, inv of invasive species, hemlock woolly adelgid is, is by far one of the worst invasive species that we have. You know, invasive species kind of exist on a spectrum. There's some invasive species that can cause some really, really bad problems for us and are really high priority. There's other invasive species that, you know, 
there are rounds, they cause some damage, but they're not really that bad or they're not really that big of a concern, big picture. HWA is certainly one of those invasive species that um, is on, on the far end of the cost spectrum. They, they cause a lot of damage. And the reason why we care is because hemlocks are um, considered a foundation species. They um, have a huge impact on the environment around them. Tons of other species rely on hemlocks and the unique habitats they create. See, the thing about hemlocks, eastern hemlocks specifically, is that they um, are really unique conifer slash softwood species, whatever term you prefer to use. Um, see, most of our conifers, like our pines, our spruces, and our firs that live in New York State, they are really um, shade intolerant species. They love to grow in you know, big open areas, lots of sunlight, the very beginning of the forest. Um, hemlocks are different. Hemlocks love to grow in the shade. And in fact, they actually cast the most amount of shade of any tree that we have in New York State. So what that means is that underneath a hemlock canopy, you get really unique conditions that you wouldn't normally get under really any other tree. Um, and if you have any hemlocks on your property, then you definitely know what I'm talking about when you walk underneath like a hemlock canopy. It just feels kind of different. Um, now hemlocks, because they're blocking out so much sunlight, they actually, um, the, the temperature underneath the hemlock tree is often quite a few degrees cooler than you would normally find even under other trees. And there's a lot more moisture that's retained underneath hemlock forests. And what that means is you get these really unique habitats, especially when you get in more like mountainous areas where you'll get these cool, fast flowing streams throwing through, flowing through hemlock forests. And these are really important for Things like our state fish, the brook trout, really rely on these hemlock streams. They can live in other areas, but we often find some of the habitat for brook trout can be in these conditions. Um, if you've ever been to the Seneca Park Zoo, um, you might have seen these guys there. These are hellbenders, otherwise known as snot otters. They're one of my favorite animals. Um, these guys are a salamander. They are they are our largest amphibian species, and they're actually the third largest amphibian in the world. They can get to over a foot long. And these guys are actually considered an endangered species. And a lot of the habitat they rely on as well, just like brook trout, are these hemlock forests. Um, and it's not only animals that are relying on hemlock forests, it's fungi as well. Um, this over here is what's called a rishi, otherwise known as a Ganoderma mushroom. These guys in North America, exclusively grow on dead hemlock wood. That's it, it's the only kind of wood that they grow on. You almost only find them in um, exclusively like large hemlock stands where you have like 100% of the trees are hemlocks. Now the reason why I'm bringing these guys up is because they, um, a lot of medical research is showing that uh, reishi mushrooms are, uh, chemical compounds they create are immensely be uh, beneficial for human health. Um, there's research that's showing that they can increase heart capacity, they can increase lung function, they can increase your immune system response, and they're even capable of um, reducing the risk of people getting tumors. So they're anti-cancer as well. So when we're talking about losing hemlocks, I think it's important that we put it in perspective, you know, we're not just losing trees on our lands, we're losing unique habitats and all of these other organisms that are relying on that. Because if hemlocks go, all of these other guys are going to. Hemlocks are also really important because these guys love to grow on cliff sides. This is a huge problem down in Ithaca. So if you look at this picture here, all of these trees up here on this cliff side, um, the only thing that's pretty much keeping this cliff from collapsing um, into the valley below are these hemlocks growing on the side. Um, and so when we're thinking about the impact of losing hemlocks, you know, sort of beyond the biological side of things, um, we're looking at huge impacts on our water quality because of all the soils going in. Um, to our streams that eventually feed into our, our various finger lakes, well, then we're looking at some really big water quality impacts there. Um, so that being said, what is a hemlock? We know it's important, you know, you, you might have it on your lands, and you might be familiar with it, but, but what is it really? So when we're looking at hemlocks, um, scientific name Suga canadensis, these guys are really slow growing. And just like what we said before, they're highly shade tolerant. They can live for over 800 years. So they're one of our longest living tree species here on the East Coast. Um, they love poorly drained areas and they are considered a climax species. Now, when we're looking at sort of hemlocks in general, um, this is just sort of extra information. It's not super important to know. 
when we're looking at the global range of all the hemlock species around the world, um, putting into perspective here, we have the Eastern Hemlock Suga canadensis, as well as its uh, closely related cousin, um, the Carolina Hemlock living here in the East Coast. But it's important to know here is that all of these other hemlock species that live out west and live over in Asia, they all deal with HWA already as a native pest. So HWA is found in all of these regions and it doesn't bother any of these hemlocks at all, it's like getting the common cold for them. It's only really the Eastern and Carolina hemlocks that are under threat. It's largely because they are sort of the most genetically distinct, the most distantly related to all of these other hemlock species. Now, what is HWA? Let's talk about what we're actually here to learn about today. So HWA um, is a tiny, tiny um, insect, specifically a bug. Um, so it's actually scientifically accurate to call them a bug. Originally native to Eastern Asia, and these guys feed on multiple conifer species, but really their impact is only felt on Eastern hemlocks. And these guys are essentially a tiny insect that is feeding on the sap of hemlocks by sucking. Where I mean they're tiny, I mean they're really, really tiny. So if we look at this penny here, all of these black dots surrounding this penny, these are the adults. These are the things that are killing our hemlock trees super duper tiny. They are actually um, at full size. They are about the width of a human hair. And the width of a human hair is about the smallest level of detail that the human eye can detect. Um, so once you start getting smaller than the width of a human hair, our eyes can't really pick that up anymore. And so that's exactly where HWA kind of lives at, at their max size. So when we're looking for HWA, don't actually see the individual intelligence themselves. What you do see are the, this, um, the egg masses that they create. So they'll create, females will lay eggs. You can see these eggs here, sort of these um, brown like ovals here. No, she will lay a, a series of eggs and she'll cover them in this sort of silky, excuse me, waxy substance that um, sort of just has the appearance of a cottony puffball. These puffballs, um, will protect the eggs and shelter them um, from the elements and from uh, predators throughout the winter months. Um, and this is typically what you're going to see when you're looking for HWA. If you're, if you're paying careful attention here, you actually see some full-grown adults over here, these little sort of like black spots with uh, the white around them right here, over here, right here, right here. It's kind of hard to pick out. These are the actual adults, but what we're seeing are these white puffballs. Now, HWA has a super weird life cycle. We're, we're really not going to get into a ton of detail here, but what's important to understand about HWA and its life cycle is that it's really counterintuitive to what you would normally expect from an insect species because HWA is actually most active during the winter and they actually go through this period called aestivation during the summer, which is sort of like a summer hibernation. The reason why that is, is because um, the same reason why we tap sugar maples actually during the winter time. Um, during the winter, that is when sap is flowing the most through the bark of the tree. And because HWA is a sap feeder, that's when they're just going to be the most active because that's how they feed. Now, HWA, um, it's kind of a weird life cycle because they actually have two different generations a year. Where we are right now, over here in March, we are at the adult stage of this longer systems generation. This generation is going to die over the next couple of weeks, couple of months. Um, and the, the, the eggs that we see now are eventually going to hatch they will feed on the hemlock tree throughout the spring into the early summer till June. Then, then those adults will die off, but not um, before they finish laying their eggs in June. These eggs will hatch. They will um, kind of find a nice spot to settle down. And really throughout most of summer, well into fall, and really not until like late December, early January, these guys are pretty much going to be invisible. They don't have any egg masses at this point. You can't actually see them even if your tree is infested. It's only during this winter and spring time frame, um, as well as um, kind of like early summer as well, that you can find in Shibuya. Now, you'll see here that they also chose them going the spruces. Um, they're, they're very specific in, in terms of what spruce species they feed on. The only, we don't have this spruce in North America, um, and it's only in Asia. And so 
they don't go to the spruce at all. And so don't worry about that. They're not going to attack your spruce trees. It's again, it's it's a weird life cycle. We don't really have the time to get into it, but it's kind of the gist of it. It's most active during the winter, and you're looking for those egg masses. Now, reproduction is super important to understand here because, see, the thing is with HWA is that the females can reproduce through a process called parthenogenesis, which means a female can lay an unfertilized egg that will hatch as an exact clone of the mother. This creates some, uh, some pretty big problems for us because it means that in North America, at least, HWA is an all-female species. So just like with humans, the men are pretty much useless when it comes to HWA, um, and we, we only have females here in North America. Now, the problem is that these guys are so damn tiny, all you need is really a bird landing on a hemlock tree or a strong gust of wind, and that's enough to push some of these adelgids um, you know, miles and miles away into a new hemlock forest. And because this is an all-female species and because a single female can reproduce by herself, it means that all you need is a single tiny adelgid to get, uh, get blown off in the winds and as long as she lands on an uninfested hemlock tree, she can pretty much take down that tree all by herself because she will be able to lay enough eggs um, to the point where she can build up a, a population on her own and take down an entire hemlock forest. So what this means is that it's really, really difficult for us to actually stop the spread of HWA because they're so tiny, there's no realistic way that we can actually stop them. Now, the feeding here um, is not super important to understand, but um, like what we were talking about before, HWA um, is a sap feeder, and specifically, it is a piercing sucking insect. They're feeding on the xylem of hemlock trees, and typically you're gonna find them at the base of the needle near new growth. So um, wherever you're gonna find the edge of a hemlock branch is where you're gonna find the most HWA. Now, see, the thing is, is that the feeding of HWA is actually not enough to kill a hemlock on its own. Um, part of it is also because the hemlock's tree's immune response um, is not really well suited to dealing with HWA. See, when a hemlock tree is infested with HWA, the hemlock tree's response is to pretty much cut off circulation to all of the needles that are infested and pretty much kill them off. Problem is, is that this isn't enough to actually kill the adelgids. And so what happens is as the HWA continues to spread throughout the canopy of the tree, taking away more and more um, energy from the sap, the hemlock tree keeps shutting off circulation to more and more and more needles, which means that it's losing its ability to photosynthesize and regain that lost energy. So it's sort of a combination of these two factors sort of playing off of each other that eventually kill the hemlock tree. I sort of think of it like, like having an allergic reaction. Like if you're someone who's allergic to like shellfish or something, you know, it's not the shellfish that's actually killing you. It's your body's imu overreactive immune response. You know, that might cause some inflammation in your throat or something. That means you can't breathe. That's what it eventually kills you. And it's kind of the same idea with HWA and hemlock trees, if that all makes sense. Now, when we're thinking about hemlocks and HWA, this stuff isn't really super important. I do want to get to more of the training stuff, but hemlocks by and large are also being affected by climate change. See, it used to be that HWA could only infest the southern end of hemlock range, but we now, now are finding that HWA is moving farther and farther north into the range of eastern hemlock that we could see here, with all these red areas being the infested counties. See, the thing is, HWA actually doesn't do really well when temperatures get down to like negative 15, negative 20, and you have a few consistent nights of that temperature. Um, and we don't really get those temperatures in our winter anymore. So it used to be that you know, area around Seneca Lake was way too cold for HWA, um, but that's no longer the case. So there are still areas, you know, like the Adirondacks and, and Northern Maine that are still too cold, but we are finding more and more HWA is able to spread into these areas. There's some interesting scientific research showing that um, areas that, you know, as late as 2010, 
used to be pretty safe from HWA that we can see in this blue area up here in northern Maine. Um, as time goes on and as the climate continues to warm, um, these areas kind of disappear and they become hemlocks that live in those areas now become susceptible to HWA infestation. The winter temperatures are not filling them off anymore. Now, when it comes to our tools to stop HWA, it's actually not all doom and gloom. We do have some pretty effective ways of dealing with HWA. That mainly comes down to three different options. So that's biocontrol, um, that's pesticides, and that's silviculture. When it comes to biocontrol, basically the idea behind that is let's take a predator from HWA's native range over in Asia, and we'll release it here in North America, and they'll be able to eat the adelgids and give the hemlocks a fighting chance. And so right now, the New York State Hemlock Initiative, based out of Cornell University, is doing a really great job doing research into these biocontrols um, to feed on HWA. So right now, there's two main candidates when it comes to biocontrols for HWA, that's using um, these special uh, Laracobius beetles and using these Leucopus silver flies. And the reason why we're using two different um, predators here is because HWA has that weird life cycle that we talked about before. There's two different generations a year. And so you need two separate predators to feed on each of those generations. So the idea here is that you have these Laracobius beetles they're feeding on that systems generation, that generation that lasts for most of the year. Then um, they will sort of die off. And then and the silver flies come in and they'll feed during more of that spring to early summer time frame. Um, this is a really encouraging uh, process. And um, the Hemlock Initiative is continuing to release more and more of these guys throughout the state. The problem is, is that they're really careful about where they're going to release these biocontrols. Um, so you can't just like, you know, get these at Home Depot or something and just release them on your lands. It's a very careful process. They really prioritize areas where there are really big, really old and healthy hemlock trees. And if there's an area where, um, you know, you might have some really unique ecological habitat that those hemlocks are in. Um, if you just have a few younger hemlocks or even just a single hemlock tree like in your front yard, this isn't really going to be an option for you. But if you're someone, hey, who owns like 100 acres of hemlock forests and they're really old hemlock trees there, this could be something to check out. Pesticides, I'm not a pesticide applicator, I'll just say that straight up, but we do have pesticides that work on HWA pretty well. These, this is dinotefrin. Um, and then there's a midacloprid. Now, basically the idea behind both of these pesticides is that they're systemic pesticides. So you either spray it on the bark of the tree or um, you it takes up through the tree's root system. But the idea here is that these pesticides enter the tree's circulatory system as the HWA feeds on, um, uh, on hemlock trees, it's also drinking these pesticides. Um, now, fortunately, both of these pesticides require the use of a certified pesticide applicator. So you would need to get an arborist or someone like that to actually apply these pesticides for you. But as a landowner, this is going to be your main option for controlling HWA on your land. Now, the specific pesticide that you might need to use um, is going to depend a lot on the context, how um, far in advance the HWA infestation is. If the infestation is um, pretty dire, then an arborist is probably going to recommend something like dinotefrin because it's a pretty fast acting um, pesticide. So it works really quickly. It could take down that HWA population um, kind of in a cinch. But the problem is it only lasts in the tree system for like a year. So you need to continuously keep applying this year after year after year. Um, so typically what people do is they'll use um, one treatment of dinotefrin for one year, and then they'll follow that up with an imidacloprid treatment. Imidacloprid is a pesticide that um, lasts much longer. It could last like five to six years in a tree system, so it could buy you some good time. Um, but it takes a good year for it just to work its way through the tree's system and into the canopy. So if you have a tree that's looking pretty bad, um, then you can't really hope that imidacloprid would, would get rid of it right away. But these are gonna be your main options. Unfortunately, both of these pesticides are, are a little bit more on the pricier side. Um, so treating the hemlocks is, is not gonna be cheap, um, but a lot of it's gonna depend on, you know, 
the rates that um, the applicators are going to be charging around you, how many trees you have, and, and all of those sorts of factors. But pesticides are an option and they can be used to treat trees pretty well. There's also silviculture. So this is the idea where you know we just sort of um, remove trees that might be competing with hemlocks um, to give them some more light, give them some, some more nutrients and water, um, create a habitat that's more like this and less like this that we have here on the right. Um, this is really cutting edge research, but it's something to keep an eye on in the future if you have hemlocks that are really close. Together, it might help to remove some of the trees around them, but this is really cutting edge research, a lot that we don't know yet. Now, with that being said, let's give you guys some real practical skills when it comes to hemlock woolly adoption. And, and first, we'll start with how to identify HWA. Well, in terms of how to identify HWA, this is it. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. Um, HWA is going to have, it's just the white fault on the underside of your hemlock tree. Sometimes you're going to find a twig that's going to be loaded with these puffballs. Sometimes it's only going to be one puffball underneath um, a twig. But either way, this is the main way you're going to be able to identify HWA. It's a really straightforward process. Um, and there's very few things that you can confuse with HWA. You might be saying, well, Matt, like, I can try to look at my hemlock needles, but what if my tree is really big? So um, I can't actually see the needles up there. Well, another thing you could use is to look at foliar density. So that is um, how packed in and healthy do those needles actually look? So this is a good um, diagram here, looking at um, the stages of decline that a hemlock will typically experience as an HWA infestation progresses. So start with a healthy hemlock tree here on the left. We have a dying hemlock tree here on the right. Now, remember, we talked about you know, hemlocks casting a lot of shade before. Hem remember, hemlocks cast the most shade of any conifer species. So when you're looking at a hemlock tree, you should see really lush, vibrant green foliage and very few canopy gaps um, in between um, any of the needles when you're looking up. As an HWA infestation progresses, what you're going to see are more gaps um, in between those needles, and you're going to see just a general loss of needles throughout the tree to the point where you kind of end up over here where you have just a few needles kind of clinging at the top, but pretty much everything beyond that is, is far gone. You might be saying, well, Matt, this is winter. Um, how am I supposed to tell these white puffballs on a tree that's covered in snow? And if you thought that, that's a great question. Um, identifying HWA in snow is usually pretty easy. So for one, um, just try shaking the snow off the branches. Snow, snow should come off pretty easily. HWA is going to stay pretty much glued onto the tree. You could always look for HWA underneath the twigs. Um, they're never going to be on top of the twigs, and they're never going to be on the actual needles themselves. They're always going to be at the base of needles, on the twigs, on the underside of those branches. So if you see anything like on top or anything, that's not HWA. You can always look for other signs of damage like canopy decline as well. Now, how do you identify hemlocks? You know, like, okay, that's great, but, you know, I know how to, I understand it. Um, identifying HWA is pretty easy, but you know I can't tell hemlock trees apart from my other trees. Well, identifying hemlocks is actually pretty easy. There's three main characteristics that we use, and hemlocks are one of the easier trees that we can identify in our region. So um, if, if you're someone who's not really good at identifying tree species, is a pretty easy uh, characteristic. So what we're going to be looking at, needles, bark, and cones. So needles, pretty simple and straight here, needles are going to be um, really short, like really, really short, um, usually about like the width of your thumbnail. Um, they're going to be flat, and they're going to actually have um, two rows of white lines on the other side. So you can see these white lines here, the underside of these hemlock needles, it's going to be white there. This is very different if you compare hemlock needles to our other native conifer species, Things like pines and spruces. So over here on the left, we can see hemlock needles, very short needles, they're flat, and they also, they also come off of the twig flat. So the, there will only be needles in sort of this flat plane. You're not going to see needles coming up or down or diagonally off the twig. It's just going to be to the left and to the right. Now with pines, um, it's different because pines will have Thing on the species, these really long needles that are in, in these bundles that we call fascicles. Um, and pine needles will often have this sort of like paintbrush appearance towards them that you don't usually see with hemlock needles. 
This is also different from spruces because spruces have short needles as well, but these needles are round. So you can actually take a spruce needle off a tree and you can rub, roll it between your fingers. You can't do that with a hemlock needle. And spruce needles are often just really sharp. Like they will, they'll, they'll have like a prickle to them and they'll, they'll, they'll poke you. Hemlock needles um, don't have that quality to them. So the hemlock needles stand out pretty well when you're comparing them to other conifer needles. Bark's pretty easy too. Hemlocks will have uh, bark that is dark brown in color with only minor ridges and furrows. And this is the foolproof way of telling hemlock trees apart from really any other tree. It doesn't always work. You might need to take a few pieces off, but if you take a chip off the bark and you look on the underside, it's actually going to have like this red, purple coloration to it. Hemlocks are the only tree that we have in um, New York that has this characteristic. So this is like a foolproof, um, you know, Cliff Notes way of, of trying to determine whether or not your tree is a hemlock or not. If it has this purple bark underneath, it's only going to be a hemlock tree. Cones are, are going to be another way, but, you know, this, we're looking at hemlock trees during the winter, so, you know, you're not really going to find a lot of cones, but if you do find any older cones, um, hemlock cones are the smallest cones of any conifer that we have. They're often less than an inch in length, usually about the size of a quarter. Um, so if you see a tree with these little cute cones either on the ground or maybe some old cones that just never dropped, um, that's another good sign that you're looking at a hemlock tree. So with that being said, how do you survey for HWA? So what we're doing at the Finger Lakes Prism right now, is we have a volunteer program where we're teaching people like yourself, um, to go out and look for HWA on their property or in local parks or wherever you can find hemlock trees to help us get a better understanding of how HWA is spreading throughout our region. And so whether you want to um, take part in this volunteer initiative or you just want to get an understanding of like, how do I assess the health of the hemlocks on my property? Um, this is a really good process to go through. So we're going to go through that right now. So when it comes to surveying for HWA, um, we at the Finger Lakes Prism use the IMAP Invasives app, um, and we generally ask people to survey at least two sites, usually by April 1st. Um, and we ask people to survey for at least 50 hemlock, but really it's just as many hemlock trees you can find. And again, this is if you want to be a volunteer and if you want to volunteer with us. If you're someone who's here just to learn about um, you know, how do I survey the trees on my property, then that's fine too. You don't have to be a volunteer. If you are trying to get a sense of what is the health of my, my hemlocks on my property, or if you want to be a volunteer, how do I assess the health of a hemlock forest? What we're looking for and what you should be looking for are three different criteria. So that's the presence of HWA, that's the average tree size of that forest, and the overall stand health. And usually when you're observing these criteria, you should be observing them in aggregate. So you, it, you shouldn't be looking at each individual hemlock tree to figure out, you know, what's the sand health of this particular tree, what's the size of this particular tree. You should be looking at it from a big picture, the whole forest, overall, in the entire forest, what is the overall sand health? What is the average tree size? Um, so you don't need to take a point for each individual tree you find. You're, you're more just kind of looking at things at, at a forest level perspective. Now, when it comes to the presence of HWA, this is simply noting whether or not you find HWA. Um, and you would consider a forest to be infested with HWA even if you only find one puffball on one tree. Even if you find a single puffball, you can essentially consider that entire forest to be infested. Because if there's one puffball there, that means that there's going to be a lot of other indulgents that um, are, are going to have the chance to spread throughout that forest. Um, but if you are um, looking at your hemlock forest, even if you don't find anything, it's still important, even if you're making observations, still take a point, even if you have a really healthy hemlock forest. Because for us, at least, a negative is just as important as a positive. It's really important for us to know where HWA isn't just as well as where HWA is. Average tree size. Um, when you're looking at, you know, a hemlock forest, we want to get a sense of how old are those hemlock trees. And so we have four different measurement criteria to determine average tree size. There are mostly large trees. So these are trees that you look at this guy over here, he's hugging this, this redwood tree. And you can see he clearly cannot reach other side of, of the tree. The tree is too big for him to reach his arms around. 
So a tree like this, we would say, is a large tree. And we have a forest that is mostly trees of this size. It doesn't need to be every single tree, but most of the trees are this size. And you would say it's a forest with mostly large trees. If you have a forest with trees that are smaller than this, that you can hug and actually reach and touch your hands on the other side, we would say those are mostly medium-sized trees. If you have a forest with trees, you can actually grab them with your own two hands. We would say those are mostly small trees. And if you have a forest where it's kind of a mix of large, medium, and smaller trees, and you would just say those are mixed trees in the stand. This is just a visualization of, of what we're sort of looking at here. Mostly large, mostly medium, mostly small, kind of making that like football diamond shape. And then if it's no dominant characteristics, you would say it's mixed. But again, you know, if you, if you have a forest with a bunch of really small trees, and maybe a couple of really large ones in there, you would probably say it's mostly small. Um, if you have a forest that's, you know, mostly medium-sized trees with a few small ones mixed in, you would say it's mostly medium. Um, it's only when it's a, like a really even mix of, of these different tree sizes that you would say it's mixed. Now, stand health. This is just looking at how much of the canopy has been lost overall across all of the hemlock trees in your forest. So again, this is looking at things in aggregate. You don't need to look at the health of each individual hemlock tree. You could have some hemlock trees that are perfectly healthy. You could have some hemlock trees that are on their last legs living right next to each other. But basically we ask that you sort of average these characteristics out um, and to break it down into different categories of how much of the canopy is left. So if you have less than 20% of canopy loss, you would say that that's a pretty healthy canopy. If, you, if you're if looking at most of the trees and they seem to have lost about half their needles and you would say 40 to 60% canopy loss, if you're looking at trees that are mostly pretty gone at that point, you would say that that's over 80% canopy loss. Basically what you're doing is you're breaking it out into increments of 20% and just deciding how much of the canopy overall um, is left in these trees. Um, and this, the visualization we saw before is kind of a good indicator of this. Um, this would be a good candidate for a tree on the left here that has um, less than 20% canopy loss. This would be 20 to 40%, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80%, and then finally over 80%. So that's pretty much it when it comes to being able to identify HWA, identifying hemlocks, um, and um, just getting a good understanding of what problems HWA is causing for us. Uh, I'm going to go really quick here into going into how to actually map HWA, if that's something you're interested in doing. So if you could bear with me for just like five to 10 minutes, we can roll through this really quick um, and learn how to map HWA. So I will just open up this other presentation here. We're going to go through this really, really quick. Um, but basically, when it comes to mapping the spread of invasive species like HWA, we use an app for your phone called IMAP Invasives. IMAP Invasives is part of the New York National Heritage Program, which is a partnership between the New York DEC and my alma mater, SUNY ESF. And basically, what IMAP Invasives does is it helps us fill in data gaps that exist between invasive species populations. IMAP Invasives is used by a ton of different folks. Um, so basically, when you enter information with IMAP invasives, you enter that information into a database that can then be accessed by pretty much all of the major players in New York State conservation. So it's what we at the Finger Lake Prism use, it's what uh, New York State Parks uses, what the Hemlock Initiative uses, it's what the DEC uses, the Nature Conservancy, all of these different folks are using um, IMAP invasives to help them make management decisions about invasive species like HWRO. But when it comes to HW, um, when it comes to using IMAP invasives, excuse me, um, we're going to kind of skip through all of this. Um, but there, just, just know that there is a desktop component to IMAP invasives. Um, and when you're using IMAP invasives, um, if you do want to take part in our volunteer efforts, um, what you could do is sign in and create an account on the IMAP invasives um, website. Um, you would then go to the main menu in the top left over here. You would go down to projects, and then you would join the Finger Lakes HWA Volunteer Survey. You would type in Finger Lakes HWA Volunteer, Volunteer Survey in this little search bar here. You would click on that um, link. It would take you to this page. And in the top right, you'll see this little button that says Request to Join a Project. You, excuse me. And then you would just hit that. 
I could send out information about how all of this works um, later on. So you can kind of go through it at your own pace, but just for the sake of time, because it is a lot, we're just going to kind of breeze through it for now. So that's how you would use the online web application for um, IMAP Invasives. Um, the main way you're going to be using IMAP Invasives is through the mobile app. This is a free app you can get on both the App Store and Google Play. So it works on pretty much any, any smartphone out there. Um, the way that the app typically works um, is that you would sign into the same account that you had before. Um, you can go through your preferences and you would hit retrieve IMAP lists here. Then it would have the project that you just created. And finally, you would just hit save at the very bottom of that screen. Now, when you're recording an invasive species, when you're recording the presence of hemlock woolly algid, um, what you would do is when you would go to this main screen here on your phone, you see the very top of this green button that says add observation. You would hit add, hit, excuse me, you would hit add observation. And what we would want you to do is take a picture of HWA um, using your phone camera. Um, you would then go down and select the species. So you would select hemlock woolly elgin, and then you would select whether you found um, HWA or not, species detected or species not detected. Now, again, remember for HWA, even if you don't find any HWA, we still want you to take a picture of a healthy hemlock twig, and we still want you to record an observation. Because again, it's important for us to know whether you find HWA or not. Now there's going to be a little map down here. It's going to show where you are. You don't need to worry about that. Um, you would want to put um, for your IMAP3 project, Finger Lakes Prism HWA Volunteer Survey. This is only going to work if you did everything on the desktop. Um, but basically, this just helps us organize all of our HWA um, points sort of in the same place. You're going to be putting um, down here below um, in the observation comments. There's, IMAP isn't going to give you, it's not going to give you any option for entering in the average tree size or the overall stand health. So that we just ask that you in the observation comments below, you enter in um uh, you enter in the average tree size and the overall stand health that you found in that forest. You would just hit save at the very bottom here. Um, and then you would then upload these records to IMAP. So once you made your actual um, observation. Um, you hit save at the very bottom. We're going to go to this, um, to the green screen that we saw before. You're going to see this little yellow card here that shows the observation that you just made. You can always hit this little pencil here and it'll take you back and you can edit it if you want to edit anything with your observation. But to upload the record, you would simply hit this little gray checkbox. You would go to the top left here where these three little lines are. You would hit that and you would hit upload selected. Once you hit upload select, it's going to ask you if you're sure, you're going to hit OK. And then it's going to load for a little bit and then should upload it to the database. Now, what's important to know here is that um, what's nice about IMAP invasives is that you can actually take records even if you don't have cell reception. Um, but the downside to that is, is that um, it doesn't upload records automatically for you. So if you see this yellow card on your phone, that means that that species has not been entered into the database yet, you have to do it manually on your own. Only when you are left at this green screen has the record left your phone and it, it is now in the database and can now be accessed by people like myself. When you are taking um, observations, good photos are essential, but we don't need to see a picture of an entire hemlock tree. We only need to see the individual um, hemlock needles themselves. And we just want to make sure that your picture is going to be um, clear and close up. So we don't want anything blurry like we have here on the left. We want something that's nice and clear, like on the right, where we can clearly see those little white puffballs on that hemlock twig. That's pretty much it. Um, if you want to be a volunteer, you're all ready to go at this point. Um, you sur survey wherever you'd like. Um, and if you have any questions about being a volunteer with us, if you so choose to be a volunteer, you can always email me at gallo at hws.edu with any questions you might have. Okay, so <laughs> I know we just went through a lot. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone has any right now. Um, feel free to check us out at our website, by the way, at fingerlakesinvasives.org and on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, you could always find us doing stuff there. I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Matt. That was a great presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Um, I, you went through the, the app 
um, sort of instructions pretty quick. So, yeah. I mean, I can certainly check it out and I've used uh, IMAP invasives for the macrophyte survey program too. So I'm familiar. Um, I can go through the process and um, be available if people have questions about signing up um, and getting set up with the app. Um, are you, would you also be available for questions if people wanted to reach out and ask questions about linking into that system? Absolutely. Yeah. And I can send, um, Caitlin like instructions on how to, how to actually set it up on your own. Um, I Great. can even send like these same PowerPoint slides if people want to go through it at their own time. I usually do, um, spend a lot more time and we actually will like go through it together on how to use IMAP invasives. But just for the sake of time tonight, you know, it usually starts pushing the presentation to like an hour and a half and then people lots of questions. And then um, just for the sake of people's time, I wasn't sure if, ever, if everyone here wanted to be a volunteer. So um, I just kind of gave the brief, you know, rundown yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, I know, I appreciate that. Um, I think the majority of people that responded to RSVP for the training, um, you know, I, I asked a few questions. One, do you want to be a volunteer um, or are you really just looking to understand how to identify HWA on your property? Um, and so the majority of people did reply that, yes, they were hoping to volunteer with the program. Okay. I think that means fully. And that, you know, of course, would mean using the app. Um, I'm glad to hear that people who may not see HWA but do have hemlocks can still use the app um, so that, because I know your focus and PRISM's focus this year is looking around Seneca Lake um, for HWA. So I think it's important to know where the hemlocks are, of course, even if they're not infested. Um, yeah. So that's good. Um, is there an opportunity for people, uh, which this was another part of the question air while trying to sign people up for the training, um, an opportunity for people who aren't really interested in learning about HWA or surveying their own properties, but know they have hemlocks on their property. Um, for people like someone from PRISM or maybe Pure Waters, anybody here within this group to go out and survey others' properties, would that be helpful to PRISM? Um, what, do you think that would add value to the program? Yeah, definitely. I think so. Okay. Um, I think the specifics of that would need to be maybe workshopped a little bit, um, depending on like my availability and obviously like everyone's volunteers availability. But if we have some people who would be interested in doing that, then yeah, we maybe we could like chat some more and get some real specifics and we can meet out in the field or something and we could do like a little crash course on how to survey for them. Okay. Um, just one other question that I have and then I'll yeah. let others ask questions. Um, I'm, you know, I'm curious because it seems like the outlook for, um, you know, the infestation that you showed on the map, uh, you know, in the Northeast or really, you know, along the East Coast. Yeah. And the uh, infancy of, you know, the biocontrol studies and things. Um, I'm wondering if there, if PRISM feels like there's, um, if there's going to be a way to come back from the infestation that we're already seeing, um, you know, if we go out and we look at our, our forests and, and know that HWA is there and very present, um, is there any way currently to, to save those trees um, or with a full infestation, would we just imagine that those trees would probably die in the coming 10 years or so? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. Like, like the thing with hemlock is like they can be saved as long as you're treating them either with the biocontrol or with pesticides. Mm -hmm. Like you can you can defeat HWA. You you'll have to keep doing those treatments forever, pretty much, because HWA isn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there are parks that have been treating HWA for like 10, 20 years now, and they still have their hemlocks. Um, okay. It just means that it costs a lot of money <laughs> to keep treating those trees. But yeah, um, as long as you're treating the trees, um, they they will last, they will survive. Um, it's just a question of like, how many trees can you treat? Can you get to all of them? Um, and those are sort of the real sticking points that we often are asking and partners are often asking us too. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's a way to prioritize, you know, what trees might want, you might want to save, like you showed that picture of those cliffs, yeah. in, uh, you know, and those, 
you know, the effects of those trees, uh, tree loss there um, might be much more significant than maybe somewhere else. So, yeah. Okay, great. I appreciate your, your answers. Um, it looks like a couple questions are coming over in the chat box. Um, can you see those, Matt? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll just start from like the earliest one. So Chris asked, do we know how HWA got to the U.S.? So HWA, um, to my knowledge, I'm a little bit fuzzier on how it got to the West Coast. I've heard both that it got to the West Coast first in the 20s. But then I've also heard that HWA has been on the West Coast for like thousands of years. So I'm not really sure like what that situation was. But at least on the East Coast, right, for like our intents and purposes, HWA first got, was first found in Virginia um, in 1951, specifically. It was the first like real population that they found. Um, and it was from um, an imported um, Japanese hemlock that had already been infested with HWA. Um, so that's how it originally um, showed up here. And since then, it's kind of um, been a story of HWA continue, continuing to spread throughout the hemlocks range. Um, so Sarah asked, can affected hemlocks recover from an infestation? Um, depends, I mean, if you're treating them, um, yes, but without active treatment, um, the answer is kind of unfortunately no. Um, we have never found the millions of hemlock trees have been infested by HWA. There's never once been an instance where um, we have found a hemlock that has been immune to HWA. We found ones that are really resistant, like they'll last a little bit longer. Um, but we've never found ones that are completely immune to it, which is really surprising because with most invasive tree pests, you usually find at least a few individuals that will be immune for one reason or another. Like, um, when the chestnut blight rolled through, you know, at the turn of the century, um, you know, there were uh, blight resistant chestnut trees that did survive. Now they were cut down anyways, because um, the loggers were trying to get <laughs> every last tree that they could. But it's kind of weird that we haven't found anything that is resistant. So um, fortunately, if they are infested, you aren't treating them, they're not going to recover. They, they pretty much will die. Um, so um, Deanna um, asks, there are many potential volunteers that are intimidated by using the app. Is there another way to report an HWA infestation and who should they contact? Um, yeah, so that's something that we do kind of run into, especially, you know, older folks who maybe aren't as tech savvy, um, don't like to use the app as much. Um, there are ways that you can use um, pen and paper to record HWA infestations. Um, I could set you up if you're interested um, Deanna, um, with the New York State Hemlock Initiative, um, and they could they could set you up on how to record um, hemlock uh, HWA presence um, without having to use a smartphone. Smartphone is by far the easiest way to do it, um, but if that is something that might be a barrier to you, you know, volunteering, then we could work that out. Uh, just feel free to shoot me an email. Let's see. Um, Timothy asked, uh, will this presentation be available for review later? I think it's more of a question for you, Caitlin. Yes, yeah, it, this uh, this is being recorded and yeah. I will share it with all the people who have registered for tonight um, and I'll have it for the general membership um, if anybody else is interested in joining the program. Matt, do you wanna mention anything quickly about the upcoming in-person trainings? Maybe people um, here might be interested in that just to get, uh, I don't know if your plans are during those trainings to actually um, give examples, uh, like physical examples of what HWA and the hemlock trees look like, um, but maybe others would be interested in doubling down on a training, and especially if that next one was in person. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we do a few trainings that are coming up, um, none for a few weeks, but we have one on, let me just make sure I'm getting my dates right. We just actually confirmed the date today, um, March 28th. So that's going to be a Tuesday from 12 to 2. We are going to be at Finger Lakes um, National Forest looking at some hemlock trees. Um, let's see one. Let me, let me look at my calendar. We, we just confirmed a bunch of new um, dates recently. We are going to be on April 1st. We are going to be at the Gully Preserve in Wayland, New York. So that's in Steuben County. So it's a little bit out of the ways from around Seneca Lake. Um, but we're going to be out there as well, working with the Genesee Valley Conservancy. 
Um, we should be. Um, this hasn't been confirmed yet. April 2nd, we will also be on um, Jenna Ganza Lake in Chenango County, um, looking at um, HWA there. And I believe April 4th, we will also be at Bowman Lake State Park um, looking at HWA. So those four in-person opportunities are going to be um, our workshops coming up. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll confirm those with you and get those out. But I, obviously the uh, Finger Lakes National Forest is, you know, yeah. are in our neck of the woods. So that's a good thing to want to join and, um, you know, physically see what Hemlocks and HWA looks like. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so Chris asked the last question here, do mild or severely cold winters impact the life cycle much? And notice on the wheel you showed, we're about at a transition point. Does our mild winter change that? Um, the answer is yes, Chris. Um, so last year, um, we had a bit more of a colder winter. Um, so this year, we're actually not seeing a ton of new HWA activity. Um, this year, obviously, we have really had an extremely mild winter by, by all stretch of the imagination. So we're expecting next year to be kind of bad for HWA. Um, we usually see the effects of the winter play out in the next um, cycle. Um, so even though we, we've been having a really warm winter so far, we're not going to see the effects of that on the HWA population until um, next year because there's just a little bit of a lag to it. Um, and yes, we are at, right, we're getting close to that transition point more towards the end of March, towards mid April. So when we're going to be moving between those two different um, generations of HWA. Matt, are there particular areas that you're looking for uh, volunteers? Um, in fact, I, I know uh, Kirk is on and uh, he lives just near the Finger Lakes uh, National Forest. Are you looking for people in? particular areas that you uh, need help yeah, so, in? Yeah, so we'll take pretty much whatever we can get. Um, there's okay. really no bad spots <laughs> to look for HWA. Now, with that being said, our like main focus, um, if you really wanted to be like a superstar volunteer, um, would be to go survey Chenango, Cortlands, and Madison counties, because those areas are on like the leading edge of the HWA invasion front. Um, and those are places where we have the most healthy hemlocks left, and it's the most undersurveyed. But, you know, around Seneca Lake, there's actually really, like, not a ton of points um, around the area because all the hemlocks are on private property. Um, so we actually really don't know what the situation is around Seneca Lake right now. So even if, you know, you're just taking hemlock points of hemlocks in your backyard, you can absolutely help us fill in a lot of those gaps. Um, because it's, it's an area where there's not a lot of hemlocks to begin with, so it doesn't really get a lot of the focus on like places like Watkins Glen and Ithaca, where they have like tons and tons of hemlocks. Yeah, I know Watkins Glen State Park up in there, there's a lot of hemlocks and they're on the cliff sides, just like those yeah. pictures you showed. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Um, and then Sarah just asked, um, are there any local arborists who would treat hemlocks on Seneca Lake? We have several on our property. Yeah, I could put you in touch with the website, um, Sarah, where you can find some arborists. I don't know any like personally, um, but I do know some good resources that you can consult uh, for that. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Matt, really appreciate your time. I know you've got a lot of trainings that are going to be coming up. So, um, you know, thanks for presenting to us tonight. And um, we'll we'll be in touch. I mean, I think we should talk about maybe what next steps are. But, you know, if we can, you know, maybe go out in pairs or groups to make people more um, comfortable, like Deanna said, with the app itself um, and just get more comfortable with, I, the identification um, of both species, hemlock and HWA. Yeah. Um, and, you know, maybe we could, you know, keep a status status chain going on, you know, how many volunteers have joined for Seneca and we can do some more push to get more volunteers for the program because I know it's very important. So um, I think, did one more thing come over? Oh, this was really great. Thanks for your time putting this together. Thanks. Yes. Um, Jim, anything else? 
No, that's it. Appreciate it very much, Matt. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah I appreciate all of you guys um, taking time out of your nights where I'm sure you could have been doing a lot of other things and listening <laughs> to me yell about bugs and trees <laughs> for an hour. So I appreciate all of you. Um, again, if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to um, reach out. Um, I'd be happy to, you know, do a quick one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting or a phone call or something. Um, do you have any questions about being a volunteer HWA or any other invasive species? Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, have a good night, everyone. You've all been great, and we will be in touch. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, yep. everyone. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a great night.